Welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. My name is Audrey Monkey, and I am your host. Here at Sunshine Parenting, I research, write, speak, and interview podcast guests on the topics of parenting, summer camp, and happiness. In episode 19, I'm talking with Devorah Heitner, author of ScreenWise, Helping Kids Thrive and Survive in Their Digital World. It's one of the favorite parenting books that I've read this year, and I learned a lot from both the book and this interview with Devorah. Enjoy the podcast. Hi, Devorah. This is Audrey. Hi. I'm so excited to finally talk with you. I loved reading ScreenWise earlier this year, and I wrote about it on my blog, and this is just awesome to be able to spend some time with you. I'd love to start with you just telling about your background and how you came to write ScreenWise. Sure. So I used to be a media studies professor. So, and before that, I was a media studies graduate student and spent a lot of years of my life learning about the history of the ways technology and especially communication technology affects our lives and our relationships. And then uh, I was about seven years into my time as a professor teaching a class called Kids Media Culture. And I just started to recognize that parents in my community really needed help with this stuff. And I became a parent at the time as well. And I just recognize that everyone was kind of panicking. It's still early days of social media then in 2008, 2009, and people were really starting to recognize its impact on family life and questions about what they should share about their kids were coming up and whether kids should get to play with tablets and smartphones and what that all means. So all of those questions were so interesting, and I found that parents were really lacking information and frustrated by their lack of information and wanting to know more and feeling anxiety pretty classic cycle of new technology, you know, um, as a historian, I would say like a pretty sick classic cycle. So I just created um, some parent talks that were featured the current research and helped parents understand the ways kids were using social media and some other tech things and started offering them in my own community and a little bit beyond. And then pretty soon I was getting calls to go speak nationally and it just really blossomed from there. I ended up leaving my job. I was a professor and doing a lot of speaking and then eventually writing both a curriculum and a parenting book. Well, you have so many great resources and it's interesting as you were talking. So for my journey, so my kids, I had, um, I have five kids and half of them were born in the 1990s (laughs) or three of them. And then my two boys were born in 2001 and 2003, and it has been a completely different parenting experience around technology and media with those two different kind of, I would call them sets of kids. And what I have found is that we as parents, we're learning about the technology at the same time as our kids. And it is so different. You know, my oldest daughter, we would never even have thought of her having a phone until, you know, at least middle school. And at the time it was a flip phone that she could call us on. And that was it. And so I just, I I agree. It's been really kind of almost scary as a parent having to figure this out and navigate it. And I come from the perspective of camp of we're an unplugged camp. And so many of the reasons parents love camp right now is because of the opportunity to give their kids a complete technology break. So I've been in this, you know, for the past 10 years, pretty much promoting getting unplugged and coming to camp and trying to figure out how to get off our devices. And so I've been sort of a, I would call it a tech negative parent until I read your book. And then I I started reading it and I was like, okay, this is a really refreshing because I do love technology and connecting on social media as well. And so do my kids. So your book gave me this whole new perspective that I really appreciate. And I think one of the things that I learned from it was just this whole concept of being a tech positive parent. So can you explain what to you a tech positive parent is or does? Absolutely. And I think, by the way, the kids probably love that break too. So it's not necessarily a a negative to give kids a break. I think it's wonderful, but I think it's good to look at the way kids look at that break as well as the way parents look at it. Because I think a lot of our tech negativity comes from what my colleague Alexander Samuel would call techno shaming of parents where, you know, we all are looking at our parenting and trying to do our best, but sometimes We fear that we're doing the worst, and the fact is it's really easy to hand our younger kids a device to keep them out of our hair, and I actually think that's a really 
can be a very productive use of tech if we do it with intention and if we acknowledge that that's exactly what we're doing. Like if we say to ourselves, right now, I am letting my kid use this iPad app because it's a really cool app and because I need to make dinner and this is a time that it really works for both of us. I think if we get thoughtless about it, it's easy to be that parent that we're judging. So I think what happens is parents get techno shamed by other parents because we we see other people hand off devices and we wonder if they're using it to sort of cheat out of interacting with their child or parenting their child, when especially when kids are younger, or if they're ignoring their kid by being on their own tech. And those are, you know, related strategies that we're all maybe, you know, sometimes cheating out of life a little bit by by being disconnected from the people in the room and being on tech. And so tech negative parenting is when we let our bad feelings about that kind of make us very reactive. We see our kid texting and we instantly feel bad about all the times that we're texting when maybe we should be interacting with them. Or we feel bad about all the times that we handed them the phone and we immediately think I should stop this. We should have a high quality interaction right now. And we don't think, well, maybe our kid is actually having a high quality interaction with her best friend right now. Maybe this is an okay time for her to be texting. Like, what's the what's my reason for feeling bad? Is it a knee jerk, shame based, you know, parenting moment, or is this dinner and my kid really shouldn't be on her phone? Right. But instead, what happens is, however bad we're feeling about tech, we sometimes project that onto our kids and kind of sometimes even randomly decide like this is a bad time or whatever, as opposed to having a more planful, you know, relationship with tech, which is obviously the ideal, and we're all going to struggle with this some of the time. But thinking more more positively about where in our home life is it tech a positive thing? Where is it bringing our family together? Where is it a way to keep in touch with people who aren't local? Where is it fun for us all to play an online game together? Where in our house do we want this to live? What are the rituals where we want the time to be totally unplugged, like maybe dinner, breakfast, right? Other meals. Maybe we want to plug time in our family. We listen to a lot of podcasts over breakfast, so I would call it semi plug because we're not physically looking at tech, but we're listening to something and now that works best. We're kind of grumpy in the morning lounge. So so listening to a podcast together is potentially more positive than attempting to have several conversations on a weekday morning at, you know, 6.30 a.m. So anyway, just really looking at where it fits into our lives and where there are opportunities to make things better, again, as as opposed to responding and reacting often from this knee-jerk place of shame or I'm a bad parent if I let my kid do this. Oh, that is, I had never heard that term techno shaming, but that is really, that's really good. I, I'm sure you might, may have come across that poor woman. She was at an airport and someone took a photo of her on her phone with her baby. That's like, like an exact example and, of techno shaming, yes. but I think we all do it all the time. Yes. And it was just one of those things like, hello, let's all have a little compassion for one another. We don't know what is going on with people all the time. And just because they're on their phone, they might need to be doing something. And like, and I guess in her case, she was trying to rebook their flight that had been canceled. And, you know, it's just one of those things. I, I think that it's with sort of all things parenting um, that, we just, we are in a weird time where instead of just being open and sharing with each other and talking about it with, you know, parents of other kids at our school, and that is where we, what we need to be doing is communicating more and being more open so that we can say, Hey, I'm struggling with this. What are you doing? What's working in your family? You know, because I know last year I had, um, so my son, let's see, he was in eighth grade last year. And, you know, both of my boys tell me that they're the quote only ones who aren't allowed to have their devices in their bedroom. Uh-huh. And they're right. the quote only ones who have to turn off all devices an hour before bedtime. And I, you know, I know that's not true, but at the same time, I don't really know what's going on with everybody else. Right. And I know Absolutely. And and we and you don't know. And the thing is that the parents may not know. Like your peers they assume that they they know everything that's going on with their kids and they may or may not. And it's not that, again, I want to get out of this, this idea that kids are necessarily deceptive and more into what's happening, which I believe is just truly a misunderstanding between generations where parents may assume, and sometimes they're assuming in a negative direction, like they're assuming their kids are using social media in the worst ways and they're using it, you know, in just like silly fun ways to keep up with friends and it's, it's not negative. So but in general, there's a lot of misunderstanding. So if you ask your peers, how their kids use devices, depending on how curious and open, you know, other parents in your community have been, you may get a very negative answer. You may get a very positive answer or a very clueless, honestly, answer where they really don't know. 
And that's because I think we don't, I think a lot of parents don't even know the questions to ask. They don't even know what Mm -hmm. they should be thinking about because Mm -hmm. it it has come into their lives, as you say, with, you know, bigger families where there may be more of a spread of age. It may be that they didn't even have to deal with it with their oldest. And Mm now suddenly it's an issue or they're getting their first child. They got a phone for high school, but now their second child is asking for a phone in fifth grade. You know, Mm -hmm. that's a very different developmental stage. And so the questions, you, the, the explicit conversations you might need to have with a fifth grader about how to deal with friendship issues might be very different than a high schooler. Right. So I really liked, and I would love for you to just talk a little bit more about how you view your kids' phone use and or technology, I guess I would say, just screen use. I loved how you described the difference between content consumption, content creation, and connection. And that really made me think about my own technology use as well, knowing that, you know, I kind of I get I get down on myself where I'm like, oh, I've been on my computer all day. But then when you think about it, what I really get down on myself about is when I do mindless scrolling. But when I'm writing something or getting in touch with a friend or setting something up that's fun, those all do seem more like more positive screen uses. So why don't you talk a little bit about viewing our kids and sort of guiding them in how they use their screens and what that screen time is made up of? That's, yeah, I think that's so important because honestly, I think if we could get past the term screen time, even I'm not sure, I still sometimes use it, but it, it's a hard term to get around, but I think it puts everything in the same box mm-hmm. and it makes us not really look qualitatively about what our kids actually doing on there. So, you know, as you mentioned in screen wise, I write about, you know, creation versus consumption and connection versus solo time and other ways of looking at what's happening on there. And all of those things can be good. You know, solo consumption can include your kid curling up on the couch and reading a book. And none of us think that that's a bad way for our kids to spend time. So it's not that consumption is bad and creation is good, but you do want to look at them a little differently. If your kid is writing her novel, you might feel a little bit less like you want to measure the number of minutes in terms of, well, you reached your, your minutes limit, you know, um, or if she's composing a symphony. Um, if your child is watching YouTube videos, you might feel like that's an okay pastime, but for a certain amount of time, and you might feel like an external limit or having something that they need to do to represent the knowledge they gain. Like if a kid loves to watch other people play Minecraft, maybe you'd like to see him bring in some of those tips and tricks into his game and ask him explicitly how he's doing that as opposed to just saying, okay, fine, watch YouTube for 10 hours and watch other people play Minecraft. Undoubtedly, there's some learning going on, but it can help our kids uh, to integrate that learning if they have to use it or articulate it in some way as opposed to just passively, you know, watching. Um, And so I, I think we really do want to help our kids for themselves identify these different ways that they're using tech and also identify and, and observe and self-regulate around how those different ways make them feel. Like I know if I stay up and lose an hour of sleep because I'm finishing a big project like a blog post or an article or research, I might feel better about it than if I just stay up because I couldn't bear not to watch the next episode of The American, but then I'm exhausted the next day because I couldn't resist the teaser that Netflix showed me very, you know, very, in a very kind of smart way, these apps make us, you know, want to lead on to the next thing and the next thing. And so, I feel very differently about my inability to get enough sleep if it's based on finishing something that has a really good payoff for me versus just watching another episode of the show. I could have watched another time and I would have been fine. That, yeah, that definitely. I, you know, it's funny. I just, I find with my kids and this is just my experience and I don't know if it's similar to other parents, but at, like I said, my two boys are the ones who have really been in the thick of this craziness with, you know, some of their peers getting devices really young and them, they had iP- iPods, I think, and, you know, iPads and think before phones even. And I was on the, I thought that I needed to monitor it all. I thought, oh my gosh. And then I just got overwhelmed by it. And then they get to high school and I just kind of have given up on the monitoring. So explain your concept of mentoring, because I think that really fits more with my belief that our role as parents is to help our kids develop social skills and understand bigger concepts and mentor them rather than check every text that they've sent and received. Absolutely. And it's great that you were aware that these other devices do the same things because a lot of people think, oh, it's such a huge deal. I'm getting my 13-year-old a phone and they don't even 
recognize that their nine-year-old was texting on the iPod for four years. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. So that they don't, they're doing all the things in, in the tech world we call them affordances. They're already doing a lot of the things that people think a phone will help them do. And mentoring is helping them understand how to do the things and how to do them well. As, you know, we don't want to catch our kids doing the wrong thing, which is often what monitoring will accomplish is, you know, catching our kids in a gotcha moment of like, oh, you used the bad word in a group text or you texted when you weren't supposed to be texting. But instead, we want to teach them to do the right thing. And a lot of that is proactive mentoring. Before your child is even texting, having a conversation about what will you do if you're in a group text and kids are talking in a mean way about another kid. How will you deal with that situation? That's a very different conversation. And it's very different to do that before versus after. Now, you may still want to be there for them when it's actually happening, but as much as possible, we want to proactively talk about some of the challenges that come up in communication. And these are really relationship challenges, not communication challenges. This isn't about whether your kid has an Android or an iPhone. This isn't about, you know, whether they're texting in Snapchat or Instagram or on the phone texting program, right? This is not app specific or text specific. This is really about friendship and peer relationships and family relationships and teacher relationships. And we, we should assume that our kids are going to make mistakes and that our, our job is not to prevent all mistakes, which is a great way to shut yourself up for failure because our kids are going to make mistakes, right? So if you think you're going to prevent them all, then you're going to feel terrible. Uh, but instead, helping kids prevent some of them, certainly, but also help them deal with and repair the mistakes that they will inevitably make that time that they do share somebody's news that they weren't supposed to share or share a photo and their friends feel left out. These are things that are going to come up in your child's digital life. And we mentoring is helping them troubleshoot, figure out solutions, figure out ways to repair, figure out when do you go to somebody in person to apologize as opposed to just sending a text. Mm-hmm. Right? And, it, and it, unfortunately for parents, it's a lot of work to mentor our kids because it's a moving target. The mentorship your fifth grader needs, you know, on, their, their iPod, you know, or another d- device might be different than what your high schooler who's newly dating might need or what your third grader whose friends get a little too mad when they play online games might need. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. There is so much great information and guidance in your book. And so I definitely highly recommend it. I'm going to put links in the podcast notes and everything. One thought, one question I have, and this is just, again, I don't know how much you know about this, but just in terms of kind of the addiction issue for both adults and kids, uh, the not being able to, you know, disengage or kind of the self-regulation of, you know, when we need to do something else, stopping with the screen. Um, What are your thoughts on that? And how as a parent, can we mentor our kids to recognize when they are just getting so drawn in and distracted that it's, it's keeping them from other things? Well, there's no question that the devices and the apps are designed without stopping points and with the intent to keep us there. And that works really well for them because we are the product in some cases of the apps, right? And so the financial model works better the more time we spend and for them, not necessarily for us. Right. So we do want to help kids help create a healthy skepticism about the ways that apps kind of hook us in and even reading books like Adam Alter's book and other books that are really describe how that design process may kind of hook us and keep us connected more than we might intend. And then working with kids to help them learn to self-regulate and be more intentional around their use of technology, figure out what the hooks are for them. For me, there are some apps that maybe aren't common hooks for other people that might really distract me and I can take them off my phone if I find that certain apps are making me feel bad, I can temporarily remove them from my phone. Or if I have a big goal, I can keep my phone away from myself and focus or turn off the Wi-Fi. So we want to help kids learn to use external and internal hacks, if you will, or tricks to keep themselves focused on what matters, whether that's finishing their homework so they can do something else, whether it's being face-to-face with friends and that might involve putting their phones in their bags to keep the, the friendship and the face-to-face really with integrity and we want kids to learn to do that. And as much as possible by high school, we want them to learn to self-regulate on that. Because having taught college for seven years, I can tell you, if you drop a kid off on campus who can't self-regulate around things like going to sleep, they will just not do it. So if you've been, you know, with your senior in high school, making them brush their teeth, making them go to bed, not giving them opportunities to self-regulate and even fail at self-regulating and see the consequences, 
uh, and working through that with them, then they will not know how to do it. <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. that's really what I saw teaching college. And that's, that's to be avoided as possible. You want to give your kid some practice. Now that's not saying I would give my fifth grader a connected device and let them keep it in their room all night and just see what happens. Um, so I'm certainly saying that parents, you know, should and, and can and absolutely must really um, help their kids self-regulate, including probably not having that fifth grader or that middle schooler, you know, or even at high school, maybe have a device that's connected in their room overnight. But at a certain point, we also need to talk with kids about how to self-regulate, you know, and that could include for me talking about how I, I have stayed up all night on the internet. Mm-hmm. And it's a disaster and it wrecks me for a week and I might get sick from it. And, you know, like there are things from it that, you know, things that happen when I do that, that are really negative. Um, but I can't say it's never happened. <laughs> so right. How do we deal with that? Right. Yeah. It's funny. I am, I usually, if I get back on my computer, like later at night, I can, I get this kind of second wind and I can stay, but I, and I'll end up staying up till midnight. But if I don't let myself and I just get in bed with my book at nine or nine 30, I'm asleep by 10. So I know for myself, I've learned that I have to self-regulate or I get too tired. So yes, I agree. We need to teach our kids these important self-regulation skills, but it is challenging. I will just say as a parent, how, how old is your, you have a son, right? How old is your son now? I have a kid who's almost nine. Okay. So some of these issues I deal with every day at home and some I'm dealing with much more with the middle schoolers and high schoolers that I work with mm-hmm. when we travel around the country. Mm-hmm. So my eight year old does not have a phone, for example. Right. Um, well, and we are not going to do a phone and he's in third grade. He's not getting a phone anytime really soon. Right. Uh, but he already has texted on my phone. He understands that it's really important to be kind in his digital communications. I mean, there are a lot of things that we do mm-hmm. deal with, including online gaming. Mm-hmm. He also doesn't yet play on a public server. Now, I know a lot of eight-year-olds do, and I think that can be okay for some kids to play on a public server with supervision at that age. Um, my kid's not really ready for a public server. So, I mean, I would also look at your child. But mm-hmm. you definitely want to know if your elementary school is on a public server or not. That that shouldn't be a shrug kind of question for mm-hmm. parents. So, you know, if you're listening and you're thinking, yeah, is my kid playing on a public server? You know, if they're 15 and they are, that's probably just it's fine. They, they know about stranger danger. They probably have pretty developed skills for creep detection. If your kid is six, seven, eight, nine, you probably want to know who they're in the sandbox with, you know, whether it's musically, whether it's YouTube, whether it's any email you're letting them access, you want to know who your kid is interacting with. And, and if you don't know, this is, there's no time like the present to find out. Oh, definitely. That is such great advice. Okay. So Devorah, besides your book, which I think all parents really need to read, why don't you tell about some of your other resources, like your website, Raising Digital Natives, and um, what you have going on there? Absolutely. So I keep a blog on my website that is you know, constantly being updated with issues that people ask about. So a lot of my blog comes from, I keep a spreadsheet of questions and you know I did a Minecraft resource roundup recently or uh, I talk a lot about friendship issues. Uh, I write a lot about texting, which I think is the sleeper skill of the 21st century. Everyone worries about social media. And, uh, so I, I want to always help parents help their kids with texting. But then just a lot of other issues that people bring to me when I speak at schools. And then uh, one, of the, one of the huge issues that everyone asks about is when is their child ready for a phone and what can they do to best prepare for a phone and support their new phone users. So I do teach a class called PhoneWise, and I've really been enjoying extending my in-person teaching into this online format. It's really been fun. And I've worked with a few cohorts of parents now launching new phone users and really just taking that time to take a few-week course and kind of focus on this transition, kind of like you took a birth course or maybe a class on how to buy your house or anything like that it's really helpful to take that time. And so that's one of the things I really encourage parents to do is, you know, in general, just slow down. If your child is wanting the next thing, they don't need it right this minute. Is this a good time for your family? Is this a good time for you? And really give yourself that time to research what this new device will mean. Is there a set of training wheels you can give yourself? Is there some experience that maybe will prepare your child for that? Can you look at what's going on in your family right now and say, well, maybe Christmas is too stressful or, you know, the winter holidays are too stressful as a time to give my kid this new device, whether it's a new game or a, a personal mobile device or anything like that. And um, my, my mission, you know, on my website and, and in my in-person work is to really try to help families make this whole experience of raising a connected kid 
less stressful, more fun, and more of a chance to look at ourselves as well, not in a shame filled way, but in a positive way of saying, oh, look, you know, teaching my kid to text, what, what are some texting habits of my own? I might like to change as I'm doing this. Just, just like when I go to the dentist with my son, it might kind of make me step up my flossing, right. <laughs> you know, a little bit to be a good example. I can also look at that, you know, with, with my phone and say, wow, or any, any digital device and say, what, what are my habits and how can I consistently model if I want to be a good mentor to my kid and to yours? How can I consistently model that and look at my own, you know, sort of crevices of behavior or places where I'm, I'm not happy or where I'm stressed out and what can I change? And that, that's, that's my hope that raising digital natives can do that for parents and also give parents some insight from the kids that I talk to and say, this is how kids see it. Kids use texting and social media and games a bit differently than adults do. And so if we can get out of our adult brain and understand for a moment how kids see this stuff, it can also help us make the rules that we set up and the plans we set up for our kids make a little more sense and feel a little bit less arbitrary to our children. And when things feel less arbitrary and make more sense, kids are more apt to you follow along with our rules and cooperate with us which is, and collaborate with us, which is what we want. Oh, I, your course looks great. I actually poked around. I saw the, um, like the sample lessons that you share. It is so comprehensive and so good. And I really wish I could have taken this course about five years ago <laughs> before, before I got into this. Cause I'm kind of uh, backpedaling now. And I, you know, I do things like send my kids, um, the research studies about how kids who you know, use tech at night and don't get enough sleep are more depressed and whatnot. So my, my, so I haven't had the same, so I haven't had the good techniques, but I highly recommend your course. I I'm kind of excited. I might just take it just to learn about it myself and pass along to, to my readers and listeners as well. Devorah, thank you so much for your time. I could talk to you about every other top. You have so many great topics in your book. So maybe we'll do it again sometime, but thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's my pleasure. And I just want all of you folks who are listening to really think about just doing one thing, you know, um, Ask your kid one question about the way kids in their community are using a specific app or just think about one thing that you can do that will make you feel less stressed out about tech. I think it can be really overwhelming. And so um, that's sort of my, my final piece of maybe advice or suggestion is try, try to tweak one thing at a time as opposed to going in and saying, I'm going to rehab my whole house around, around this stuff. You mean like when, we, when my husband and I threatened to take all the TVs and computers out of our home? <laughs> That's a little extreme. Well, I think every parent has probably made that threat at some point. So you're not alone there. But really, and just and just remember, too, that you have wisdom. Your kids have this tech savvy. Like, you have wisdom. You've lived through not being invited to a party. You've lived through conflict with a peer. And so our kids may be experiencing those things in a new way and mediated in a new way. But you have a lot to offer. So I always want to remind parents that you have a lot of wisdom and Please don't throw up your hands and give up. Our kids do really need us to help us with, help them with this stuff. Oh, definitely. And I just, I loved, I just kind of end with when you talk in your book about how what's at stake with this tech stuff is not just, you know, our kids and screens. It's really just so much more than that. It's about their relationships, their reputation, how they manage time and that self-regulation we talked about. So this is such an important topic. And I appreciate you are serving in a very important role of educating all of us on how we can approach this more positively. So thank you so much for all of your work and for being on the podcast today. Thank you. I had a great time chatting with Devorah for this episode of the podcast, and I really learned a lot. For notes, links, and other information about topics we discussed, please visit sunshine-parenting.com and search for episode 19. I'll close this episode with a thought from Devorah in her book, ScreenWise, that encourages us not to techno-shame one another, but instead to be open with each other. Devorah says... The more open conversations we can have with other parents in our circles, the better prepared we are to meet the needs of this generation of kids we are raising. This is especially true if our interest in the discussion comes from a place of openness and a genuine intention to help. Simply breaking the ice by saying to another parent, Sometimes I am overwhelmed by all this technology. Where do I start with the rules? How do you guys do it? Could be a great invitation to an honest conversation.